So you know how before a guy does a shirtless scene in a movie, he'll like do a bunch of curls and push-ups in order to like make everything look pumped and whatnot. I do that too before I film. Uh, but the joke's on me because it turns me beet red. Laura B asks, what's your favorite dinosaur? All of them. So, of course, I've thought about this, and it's it's impossible for me to come up with just one dinosaur that's my favorite. The best I can do is, like, my favorite dinosaur for each clade of dinosaurs. Like, I've got a favorite sauropod, a marcosaurus. Uh, favorite hadrosaurs, probably parasaurolophus. Favorite theropod is probably, like, a probably a tie between Cryolophosaurus and Therizinosaurus. Does it make sense? Is it possible for Styracosaurus to be my favorite Marginocephalian, but Nezuroceratops to be my favorite Ceratopsian? Tanner V asks, before going the writer-director route, did you ever consider focusing on acting uh, or voice acting instead? Uh, so the short answer to that is not really, not seriously. I was involved in acting in high school. I was very involved in high school theater for three years, uh, and I loved it. High school theater is where I found uh, kind of like my love of art. But it wasn't specifically because I was acting, uh, it was just because I was involved in the creation of art. Uh, and I always wanted to be a writer. Writer was always the prime thing I was going for. Even in high school, uh, when I was acting, I was always doing more writing on the side. To say nothing of the fact that I don't think I was I, I don't think I was great at acting. Like, I did a cameo in my own movie, uh, but that wasn't because I particularly wanted to. Uh, it was because uh, I couldn't find anybody uh, to fill that role for the day. So Tanner V asked, when's the next episode of The Foster Fuelers coming out? So one of the first things I did on my channel was I made a trailer and the first episode for a planned nine episode series uh, about a bunch of dinosaurs uh, at cross purposes with each other. Uh, and, and the first episode is still up on my channel. I don't think a lot of people have seen it because it, again, it's like one of the first things I did. I might have had 500 followers when I posted it, uh, but it is still one of the proudest things, one of my favorite things that I have ever produced uh, and put my name on. Dearly subjected, we are gathered here today to witness the union of Quincy the Bipiosaurus and this volcano. When I produced that first episode, it was just, uh, I didn't know any actors yet. Um, and so it was just me and another very gracious friend who agreed to voice all the characters. Um, it was a blast, but I still don't think I was particularly good at it. I think I was good enough for a no-budget YouTube video. I have several other episodes scripted, and I've got the, uh, the first season all plotted out. Uh, but if I did it now, it would be much more organized, and I'd bring in a lot more talent. I would bring in as much talent as I could afford. The long story short is that in what little dabbling in acting that I've ever done, all it has taught me is just how difficult it is. Brini asks, are you working on any screenplays right now? If so, any hints? Uh, so I'm always working on something. Uh, the Fossil Fuelers is something that's been in my drafts folder for years now. I have the first four episodes scripted. Those are done. Uh, the other five episodes uh, are not, uh, they're plotted, but they're not written yet. Right now, I'm stuck in the second act. Second acts are difficult. Uh, and I'm busy trying to bridge the first and the third acts together. I'm also working on a short film script that I that I like, that I'm excited about. It's exciting to me not only because of the story, which is about interesting things that I care about, but also it's it, once this thing is done being scripted, it's something I could film myself. It takes place in one location. Uh, it takes place basically in real time. There are no scene changes. It's just six people in a room. No, no expensive special effects required. Also, who would be your dream collaborator on our film? I mean, of course, there's so many people, uh, so many actors and cinematographers and uh, writers that I would love to collaborate with as a writer. Um, but let's just to keep it simple, I would I would give Steven Spielberg any script I've ever worked on, uh, no questions asked, for him to go ahead and direct. Um, I'm a big fan of Spielberg from way back. It's he, every most everybody is a big fan of Spielberg, so I don't really talk about it that much, but um, I would let him direct anything. John Carpenter too. I would collaborate with John Carpenter on anything, film or otherwise. Like, I would collaborate with John Carpenter on, like, putting together an Ikea desk. Ellen N. 
asks, what's your video script writing process and your screenplay writing process? Uh, so this is a really good question. So in order to write a screenplay, I need two things. Uh, a topic that interests me and a question that keeps me up at night. And looking back on the scripts that I've finished or even just the ones that I've started, uh, that remains consistent. Like I'll write a script about deep space exploration uh, and that'll be the topic that interests me, but then the question that keeps me up at night is like, how much time does humanity have left before it destroys itself? Uh, and then I combine those two into a story. As for the script writing process for these videos, that's also a good question. It starts off kind of like writing a term paper, where, uh, you know, I'm, I'm using very precise language to describe exactly what I'm thinking about diff all these different topics, but then I go through on multiple passes uh, to make it sound more vernacular, to make it sound less like a term paper and more like a conversation I could have with a friend. The hard part about writing a, a video is not determining the content of the video. The content of the video is actually decided pretty quick. Structuring it is what takes forever um, because it's not just about getting the content out there, it's about structuring it in a way that might, hopefully, fingers crossed, make the audience feel something. Almost like, I try to treat my video essays almost like um, little movies, little short films that make you feel something. Also drop your hair care routine. Uh, so in terms of hair care, I don't have any big secrets. Uh, the one tip I've got uh, is don't shampoo your hair every single time you shower. That'll dry it out and maybe turn it brittle. Uh, and that reminds me of this great story of when I was, uh, I was a bar trivia one time. And the question was, according to some poll by some magazine, what do women wash three times as often as men? And all the men at the table instantly said hair. Like, like somebody was writing hair down on the answer sheet before anyone had even discussed it. And the women at the table were like, no, 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 it's not hair, it's bed sheets. And the way that these men's faces paled around the table, you could tell, they were like, oh, you can wash bed sheets? Liz asks, how do you currently make your living? Uh, so I have a clerical position in the legal field. In terms of discussing current employment, that's about as specific as I like to get. Uh, but I will say uh, that my previous employer, uh, I worked as a consumer bankruptcy paralegal for almost five years. So besides my taste in movies and dinosaurs, the other subject that I actually know more than nothing about is consumer finance. And I'm thinking maybe one day that'll make it into a video. Christine J asks, what's your white whale essay topic? The one you'd love to tackle, but likely will never film. Uh, that's a great question. That's a fun question to answer. Probably anything about TV. Not only because I don't really consider myself an expert on TV, like I'm a fan, but I'm not super privy to the processes that TV goes through to produce emotion in the audience. I think it's a very different medium from film. I think television could be just as different from film as like theater is from film. So first I would have to find a TV show that I felt I understood exactly how it was operating. But then secondly, the amount of content to then pour through and curate and cite in order to make a video would be, it'd just be so much time. I will say, uh, if I do make, I've been thinking about this recently, about doing a, a video on specific TV shows, and the top contenders are all computer animated TV shows from the 1990s. That's all I'll say right now. James Summerton asks, you bet your ass I'm gonna say your whole name. James Summerton asks, so my question, hmm, will you go on a date with me? Uh, well, I'm very flattered, uh, but the truth of the matter is, um, I am not single. Daniel Sibaha, I'm um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, Daniel Sibaha asks, do you watch many non-English films? And if so, do you have any recommendations? Um, so I definitely probably watch more English films. I mean, I definitely watch more English films than anything else just because that's what I've got the most access to and that's what's being advertised to me the most. Although I did recently finish Dark on Netflix, which was a show that I really liked uh, involving time travel. It's like if if Stranger Things and Lost were combined and given purpose. Max Baker asks, do you write the scripts or your videos the same way you talk, adding jokes and personal touches as you write? Or do you try and get your information and thoughts on the page first before going back and editing the draft into something that sounds like a Cold Crash Pictures video? Uh, so that's a great question. 
I do try to get my thoughts down on paper as fast as possible just so that I don't forget them. Uh, but my writing voice is different from my speaking voice. So what I wind up doing, the first draft is usually like a term paper. Uh, and then what I do over successive drafts is I edit it down to make it sound like something I could say in conversation without sacrificing clarity and um, hopefully funnier. Uh, that's a big thing. If I could, I don't know how funny you guys think my videos are, um, I, but I know that my goal for the channel is to always make the videos funnier. Uh, and sometimes I'll deliver the script to my script consultant uh, and uh, the script consultant would be like, is this, is this a joke? And I'd be like, yeah, you didn't think that was funny? <laughs> Max Baker also has a quick list of this or that questions. Uh, cake or ice cream? Both. 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 Both is good. 90s or 2000s aesthetic? Uh, probably 90s. Coke or Pepsi? Surge. Boxers or briefs? Wouldn't you like to know? Tammy and the T-Rex or Theodore Rex? Okay, so both of these films were on the list of dinosaur films I wanted to talk about at some point in my new series, Sorry in Cinema, but I haven't actually seen either of them. They're both on my watch list. Uh, when I see both of them, uh, I will be sure to tweet in response as to which one I prefer. Netflix or Hulu? Well, um, Netflix has more content, but Hulu is more carefully curated. Uh, but honestly, when it comes right down to it, only Hulu has little woods. Slasher horror or psychological horror? For me, personally, definitely psychological horror. Rather than comparing the best of each genre or even the worst of each genre, I think like the mid-level, the mid-tier, mid-quality psychological horror, I enjoy a lot more than mid-tier slasher horror, if that makes sense. Physical or ebooks? Okay, so I definitely prefer physical books, but my bookshelf is getting pretty full and ebooks are often cheaper. So if I don't have room and the ebook is on sale, I'll usually go with the ebook. Disney Channel or Nickelodeon? Uh, I mean, I'm gonna have to go with Disney Channel. They're the ones with Smart Guy. Gushers or Fruit by the Foot? Gushers. As if you need to ask. Reese Gallagher asks, do you think that musicals work better within the stage or in a movie? That's a good question. Uh, it's actually, it'll probably be announced by the time I post this AMA of my next video. It's gonna be about musicals, um, so I'm gonna save my answer for there. Reese then asks, favorite slash least favorite Kurt Vonnegut book? Uh, well, so from back to front, I've only actually read two, and I like Slaughterhouse Five more than Galapagos, so there you go. But I do love Slaughterhouse Five, everybody should read it. Gordon Dell asks, are you at all musically inclined? Do you play any instruments? Uh, the answer is no, I don't. Furthest I ever got on any instrument was, uh, like playing hot cross buns on the recorder in elementary school. There was one, one weekend in high school when I asked if I could borrow a friend's acoustic guitar and he gave it to me and he taught me like rudimentary lessons. He gave me like a songbook. Now I played all weekend and I ended the weekend with like, with like calluses on all my fingertips. Uh, but at the end of that weekend, I still couldn't change a single finger position. I still couldn't find a single guitar string without looking down at the guitar. Now I know, I know it takes more than a weekend to learn the basics of acoustic guitar, obviously. But look, when you, when you learn a new skill, uh, you go through four phases. The first is unconscious incompetence, where you're no good at it, but you don't know that you're no good at it, uh, so you continue. The second part is conscious incompetence, where you're no good at it and you know you're no good at it. This is the part where you're practicing a skill and it feels like you're getting worse. You're not getting worse, you're just realizing where you're making the mistakes. The third phase is conscious competence where you're getting better and you know you're getting better but you have, still have to think about how to improve and then finally the fourth step is unconscious competence where you don't even need to think about it uh, in order to just practice proficiently anyway i bring all this up because when it comes to music i skipped that first phase where i couldn't tell i was bad and all i know and all i knew was how fun it was uh i jumped right to the second phase where i knew i was bad and it was, I don't know, it was discouraging enough for me to give it up after a weekend. And that's all that I have to say about that. Sarah Hall asks, what's your next big milestone? I hope you're aiming high. Bonus question, what's your favorite TV show of 2019? Uh, so next big milestone, you know, this was already such a big milestone, I haven't really thought about it. I, I honestly, I never thought I would make it to $500 a month. Um, and 
I have you all to thank for that, and I cannot thank you enough. Uh, I never thought I would reach 120,000 subscribers. I mean, there's always, I guess there's always like a stated milestone to get to next. Like I'll probably have another big Twitter post about um, subscribers when I hit like 200,000. But honestly, having never thought I'd reach this point, <laughs> I don't spend my days trying to figure out how to get to the next Patreon goal. Uh, I, I just try to, I, I'm trying to figure out how to thank you guys properly. Anyway, what's your next big milestone? Like for me, um, you tell me that and I'll, I'll try and do it for you. And what's your favorite TV show of 2019? So I actually listed a bunch of them uh, at the beginning of this year's top 10 favorite films video. 2019 gave us the premiere of Shrill, The Return of Fleabag, Watchmen, Dairy Girls, Chernobyl, Unbelievable, Big Little Lies, Falling for a Killer, the best season yet of The Marvelous Miss Maisel, and the series finale of The Good Place. But since that video, I have also watched a black lady sketch show on HBO and that that's probably a top contender as well uh everybody should go watch that olivia hare asks what books slash films have shaped you the most in becoming the person you are today and have any books and films particularly challenged or previously held views and conceptions about the world um so that's a good question i wouldn't necessarily say that my opinions came from fiction books and films but i will say that around 2004, 5, 6, and 7. Those are very formative years for me, uh, just in that I was becoming an adult. Th those were the years that for the first time I was, how do I put this? I was noticing the, the thoughts and values that were important to me reflected in my cinema, uh, reflected in the media that I was consuming. So I wasn't just watching for entertainment, I was watching, I guess you could, I guess you could say, I was watching for catharsis for the first time. And I was seeing my values and my thoughts reflected in media like, there was a bunch of films from that time period, Serenity, Lord of War, Jarhead. I was finally recognizing them in fiction as something that other people we're also experiencing and creating art to respond to it. Luke Vale, Valley, I'm sorry, I don't know if the E is silent or not. Uh, Luke asks, what was the last film you saw in a theater before, you know, the world ended? Uh, and did you like it? Uh, so this is true. The, the last film that I saw in theaters before quarantine started, I saw Birds of Prey three times in two weeks and I regret nothing. Jason Blodgett asks, or Blodgett, I'm sorry, I'm. I'm sorry if I butchered your name in this. Jason asks, how will PC culture, no matter whether right or wrong, have a negative impact on comedy? I'm not not entirely sure what you're getting at there. Um, Cause you say whether it's right or wrong, but then you say it'll have, how will it have a negative impact? I guess the long story short is I don't think offending people is an essential ingredient in comedy. And when I look at some of my favorite comics who are practicing today, like John Mulaney, Hannah Gadsby, they're not known for offending everybody. I don't think PC culture has to negatively impact comedy at all. What do you see as the next genre boon given superhero movies will become oversaturated? Um, pandemic media? What's the best thing about running a YouTube channel? Um, probably the independence. I get to write about whatever I want, uh, whatever my latest hyperfixation is. I get to spend a month consuming it and it suits my sensibilities, I guess. Scarlet Letter asks, could you describe your high school and college experiences? Growing up in a Confederate background, how did you come to have such progressive beliefs? Uh, so that's a really good question, uh, and they're linked. So I generally had a better high school experience than I did a college experience. High school was where, I tell you, I found that theater group and it was, it was like the most progressive environment I'd ever been in. It was the most accepting environment I'd ever been in. It was the most creative. Uh, and I got a lot of support there. I got a lot of emotional support. I got a lot of artistic support. It was just such a great environment that was so interested in letting me figure out how to become a better person. Once I got to college, not so much of that. Like I remember I spent a lot of time in first year trying to join clubs and stuff and it just kind of fizzled out. You'd think I would have become a member of the, of the, the University of Chicago uh, Film Society, Film Club. Uh, I tried filming something with them uh, and they kept all the footage and stopped returning my emails. Anyway, college seemed less interested in, I could never get a beat on what college wanted from me or what it wanted me to learn. Uh, and I was paying through the nose for it. So yeah, high school was definitely probably a better experience than college. 
I felt like I learned more in high school. And as for in my high school experience, is kind of the answer to the second part of your question, growing up in a Confederate background, how did you come to have such progressive beliefs? So my hometown is a very conservative town within a very progressive county. And my high school was in the progressive part of that county. My high school was very, um, I guess the word is cosmopolitan. It's like 25% white, 25% black, 25% Hispanic, and 25% everything else. Uh, and it wasn't just diverse in terms of race, it was diverse in terms of financial backgrounds. It was diverse in terms of thought. Uh, and, uh, and not to say that, you know, you have to hang out with regressive people and progressive people, but I embedded myself in the progressive crowd. And that's really where the course correction happened. And then Scarlet Letter asks, if you had to make a whodunit film, a la Clues or Knives Out, how would you go about it? Um, so I guess I don't have any super specific ideas. I do think though that the best whodunits, like the two that you mentioned, Clue and Knives Out, they have the same goal of any good screenplay, which is to give the audience an ending that is both surprising and makes perfect sense in hindsight. Uh, those are, in my opinion, the two ingredients for any great twist. The audience can't see it coming, but it has to make perfect sense when they look back on it. And I think, fundamentally, the whodunit is not any different in that regard than any other screenplay. Catherine asks, if you've never talked about this before, where did the moniker Cold Crash Pictures come from? I'm so glad you asked that. I have, I think, explained it on Twitter, but never in a video before. So, Cold Crash was the name of the first long-form fiction that I ever finished. I was in high school and I wrote a play. It was like 40 pages long, but it had like a first, second, third act. And it was like the first, it was the first thing longer than a, a short story that I ever finished. It tells the story of, it was a plane crash in Antarctica, which I was convinced I could stage in, in like a high school auditorium. Uh, and there's like eight survivors. It's like four pairs of survivors. And each pairing of people, the characters, they've got baggage and they've got backstories with each other. And by the end of the play, it's all sort of, all of their intermixed motives are like putting everybody at cross purposes with each other. It was not good. And I feel that's important to say because um, I have, I have a self-deprecating streak in me. Uh, should probably get that looked at. But the idea was to name my channel after something I did that was bad um, as a way to sort of maybe preempt criticism, I guess? Except it doesn't exist. As far as I know, every physical copy was destroyed before I even got out of high school. So maybe it wasn't a way to preempt criticism so much as a way to... Uh, it's nice to think about how far I've come as an artist. So thanks again to everybody, not just who pledges to Patreon, which is great, uh, but also anybody who gives me your time and attention. There are so many things that, that demand our time and attention. The fact that anybody gives me any of it is just its very humbling and it makes me want to do better and better. And so even just watching this AMA, if you made it this far, thank you very much. And um, I hope to see you soon with some great content. And stay safe out there, guys.